So, first thing we're going to demonstrate are the muskets themselves. They were the workhorses of the 18th century, not the rifle. Uh, rifles are kind of glamorous and sexy, but they take about a minute to load and fire one shot. In that same minute, you can load and fire these three times. So these were the machine guns of their day, but again, not as glamorous. They also mount a bayonet, something rifles did not at that time. They used a flintlock ignition system, could be cantankerous, not always working. That's why they fired as a group. You fired volleys. They wore bright uniforms to stand out in the open. They used flags to help to communicate as they were moving around. I know that seems kind of silly, but next time you watch American football, guys in bright uniforms standing in line in an open field, bashing the snot out of each other. You are cheering for linear tactics of the 18th century. So it's the same concept. So, the process of loading would have been very simple. Prime and load! So they would have been taught a drill of the individual steps, but what they would have grabbed would have been a cartridge. That cartridge had a rolled tube with a pre-measured charge of powder and a musket ball in it. So you're not fumbling with loose components. Using their teeth, they would tear it open, prime, shut the pan, and then cast about. Now you can actually see which of our volunteers has had a little bit more experience with it. Gonna go ahead and fire, so if you have sensitive hearing, go ahead and cover up. Fire! Take your hammer saw. See, our name for him is French bait. <laughs> Gotta put on full cock. He'll learn. It's fire. Oh, his first one for the day. So what we had was a failure to spark. That's where the flint was not sharp enough to shear off pieces of steel off of the prison. It's sharp enough, if it does it right, that's, those little sparks are over 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's enough to set off the powder. So he probably has enough goo from firing all day. That tends to foul up the flint and make it dull. And again, nice, nice to have help from the French. Fire! <laughs> but don't poke off. There you go. So before we fire the artillery piece over here, I'll let my crew get over. In September of 1754, in the South Carolina Gazette, this poem appeared in that newspaper. It begins, says, to the memory of Peter, Lieutenant Peter Mercier, Esquire, who fell in the late battle near the Ohio River in Virginia, July 3rd, 1754. Peter Mercier was part of the South Carolina Independent Company. And they were fighting in these trenches with the Virginians. He was wounded once, remained at his post, wounded a second time, incapacitated as he's being carried into the triage area within the stockade. As he's passing the gate, a musket ball would pierce his skull and kill him. We have an account from a book that just recently came out dealing with William Trent's fort, of an author found basically the next day this poor man's body was dug up by the Native Americans and scalped. We're often asked, where are the bodies? We don't know. Um, one year after this battle, when Braddock's army marched through, an officer commented that he saw human bones scattered about. So out of respect for the loss of life, we keep this a nice place to visit. We don't have the National Cemetery like Gettysburg and other places that show you the cost of war. But this poem was written to Peter Mercier's memory. Oh, lost too soon, too early snatched away, to joys unfading and immortal day. Happy had thy duration been prolonged to vindicate the British interest wrong, since none more ready to defend its cause or to support religion and its laws. In thee, our royal sovereign has lost as brave a soldier as troops could boast. A lot more to the poem. I didn't do very well in poetry in college, so I'll spare you that part. But he was memorialized like many of the other soldiers that had fought here in 1754.
So we're going to shift gears, talk about the cannon. So if you want to kind of do like the 20th main, you can kind of extend the flank to the right or left. Musket, there would have been a prepared cartridge, often a linen bag or uh, sheet lead that would have been made into a cartridge filled with powder. the Virginia Regiment, lost in this battle, William Bailey, Garrett Clark, Thomas Fisher, John Kitson, Daniel McLaren, Barnaby McCann, William Pullen, John Ramsey, John Robinson, Thomas Scott, William Simmons, John Tratton, Independent Company of South Carolina, Lieutenant Peter Mercier, also of the British 17 unknown, of the French and their Indian allies, two unknown French soldiers, one native ally, also lost in this battle is what Washington called his valuable servant. He did not give his name, but he asked to be compensated for the servant's loss here at the Battle of Fort Necessity. So to him and all the others who mentioned, we will not fire this salute. If you have any hearing issues, you're welcome to cover up. Take aim! Fire! Peace. 
Hopefully you got a good whiff of that smoke. I hear it kills corotas. So, anyway, I want to thank you folks for coming out today. Uh, thank you for assessing this visit on July 3rd. If you knew it was our anniversary, that's awesome. If you didn't know it was our anniversary, it's still awesome. These are your national parks. Take advantage of visiting them, learning about them, because by learning about them, we learn about ourselves. And that's why they're important. If you'd like to visit our camp, we do ask you to help preserve our breastworks by going around and not over them. We have folks to answer your questions. The cannon is also secure, so you are welcome to visit back. Thank you and make it a safe holiday. Thank you.